Viola. So we are about to start. Welcome everybody to the Scientix 2 webinar series. Uh, my name is uh, Viola Pinci and I'm a member of the Scientix team at uh, European Steam Net. And with me today here, uh, my colleague Adina Nistor. You can, her in, you can see her in the list uh, with the Scientix account. And Adina will provide us with technical support and we, uh, she will manage the messages from the chat. Our presenter uh, for this session is Patrick Dandon, uh, Scientix Deputy Ambassador for Ireland, and we'll talk about quirky ideas to pick and promote student interest in STEM classrooms. Before we start, I would uh, like to give you a, just a quick remember on the structure and timing of the session. And I would like to ask you to please turn off your cameras and microphones during the session. side of the screen, you can activate the chat. Chat if you like to share comments or suggestions with the other participants during the I would like now to leave the floor to Patrick. Welcome Patrick and thank you for being here. Thank you Viola. Thank you. Am I now in charge of the presentation, Viola? Thank you. Perfect, you can. I'll begin. Sure. That's great. Thank you, Viola. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my own name is Patrick Dundon, and I'm a Scientix Deputy Ambassador for Ireland. Um, I'm very conscious that I am going to be speaking <laughs> my native tongue, and I might be speaking very quickly, so I will hope to try and speak slowly. And if anybody needs anything repeated, or if I'm going too quick, please stop um, uh, straight away. Um, the, the, the title of the webinar today is... Um, is it moving there, Viola? Sorry, my apologies. Um, the title of today's uh, webinar is Quirky Ideas to Promote Student Interest in STEM Classrooms. And I have been thinking about it since it probably would be better titled as just Tips and Ideas to Promote Student Interest in, in STEM Classrooms that I've um, picked up myself over maybe a 12, 13 year career at this stage. Um, the third, fourth and fifth slides I think are videos, which I won't but if anybody wants the presentation subsequently, I'm very happy to email it to them or upload it to Dropbox or whatever. Um, I would be very happy if people were to give their own suggestions as well during the course of the webinar. Um, I'm sure there's loads of experience amongst us all here, and it'd be great to share some ideas. Um, by, by no means do I have all of the ideas here, and I'd be loving, I'd love to learn something myself today. I think it'll take maybe, I think, 25, 35 minutes, the presentation. Uh, and then ultimately my hope would be that um, you would get something that you'd be able to take back and maybe try with your own classes. It could be something very, very small, but it might make a little bit of a difference. So I'll crack on with the presentation now and hopefully uh, I'll go relatively slowly. Thank you. Okay. So that's just basically my own introduction there, uh, and I've gone through that. I teach in a secondary school in Ireland. It's uh, mixed. It has boys and girls. We have about 1,300 students, and their ages would range from about 13 to 18 years of age. Um, I was going to start you with a tour of my lab with videos, but it's just too much. Uh, technically, it's a little bit beyond me, so I'll just show photos instead. And again, if you want the video, absolutely, I'll email it to you. And just fast forward through those quite quickly. Now, my, I suppose the trust of my presentation is just ideas for, for kind of gaining student interest. And the first one is to make your lab stand out. 
Um, the corridors in schools can be very boring in a lot of cases, and I try to ensure that when students are passing my door, that they know that there's something interesting going on, so there would be lots of colour. I have got huge uh, positive feedback on using these science mims. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of them. They're kind of little funny little posters in a lot of cases with a science team, but they get great interest. Sometimes they're just funny stuff, and I'll show you examples of them as we go along. So this would be the corridor to my laboratory. Uh, as you can see on the left-hand side there, it's quite bland, but I make sure to have lots of posters, lots of colour as people approach. So their eye is drawn to the door. Uh, lot, again, these things are very colourful, and they in, introduce students to the whole idea of inquiry-based learning, asking questions. Similarly up here, would all be around inquiry-based learning. Now, of course, we can't see these, but if anybody wants a copy of any of the materials they see here, I'm very happy to forward them on. Um, also on the door, you will notice I have these things. and there, These are the MIMS that I was talking about earlier on. Uh, and I always put these up. I try to change them every day. And it keeps students coming back to the door. Uh, and they love looking at the posters. And any posters that I've used, I stick them up inside the laboratory as well, and you'll see those in a moment also. Also, I'd include some science literacy and numeracy materials here. So when they're queuing outside the door to come in, they would be able to read through that. And of course, the obligatory science laboratory rules ever before they enter the lab. These are the MIMS. I've just included a selection of these a very small number. Uh, I have, at this stage, I must have three or four hundred of them on a PowerPoint, and I uh, will routinely change them on the door and put them up around the lab. This is a nice one to introduce the scientific method as well, uh, related back to an infant and how they're so curious, picking up keys, micro, uh, mobile phones, etc. In effect, they're doing little experiments. For the maths teachers, some silly stuff here, just to get the idea of the tan ratio, the tangerine. I predominantly teach biology. I really like this one, the whole idea of heterozygotes. They remember that. They may not have any idea what a heterozygous, heterozygous means, but they'll remember the image. And this is applicable to all of us. We we'll all be familiar with Newton's cradle. So they're the science memes and they get a great reaction by the students. I've been doing that for three or four years. And of all the things that I've probably done in my teaching career, that has got the most positive feedback from all of the students. And it's very little work. Again, this is on a related point, but uh, the laboratory, once they're in the door, it needs to be very, very uh, visual, lots of colour. We're very fortunate in that our subject has lots of interesting stories, uh, lots of interesting subject matter and we put that on display. Um, some of the stuff is deliberately there to quirk or to pique their interest to get them asking questions. And I'm a big believer that oftentimes it's better if students leave the class with questions rather than simply answers. And at, at the end of the day, that's at the heart of science. It's about trying to explain what they observe around them. So you want to develop that curiosity, that innate curiosity. This would be some still pictures of my lab. Apologies for the posters. They've fallen down over the summer. We're just back since last week, so I must get uh, around to sticking these posters back up. Uh, I'm very fortunate in that we have a nice big lab uh, and lots of air, big high ceilings. And you can see the men's here are all around the laboratory, lots of, and a number line as well for students. periodic table as well, nice big periodic table. And then looking up from the back of the lab, I'm going to talk about this corner here in a minute. It's at the front of the lab in all of the students' eye line, and it's where I keep uh, my collection of toys, I think is the best way to describe it. Yeah. So uh, just on that point, I have that corner in the lab and all of the stuff that I've kind of accumulated over the years that has a science or a maths twist on it, I bring that into the lab and I put it on display. And again, 
with a view really to getting the students coming up to you asking you questions about it. Also, they, in a lot of cases, they probably don't realise that you've got a bit of a sense of humour yourself, so it's no harm sometimes. It helps to build positive relationships with the students when you can talk about things that are kind of uh, nearly childish. So some of the stuff I would have on display, I'll show these later on, would be lots of puppets, uh, the nodding board, uh, lots of books that I would have kind of accumulated over the time as well, uh, just small bits and pieces. And a lot of this stuff has been sourced on Amazon or eBay or um, there's one very interesting website that I'll refer to later on, the Philosophers Guild. Dot com, some very good stuff on that. Yeah, some of the toys now are just uh, just that uh, for nothing for no other reason, just to get a little bit of a reaction. So that was a very popular song there a couple of maybe eighteen months ago, and that that uh, cup kind of reflects that. Some of the more traditional toys would include obviously uh, the Newton's cradle, which we get a lot of value out. I teach physics as well. And a lot of the time I will start uh, my discussion of mechanics with just by simply putting the Newton's cradle on the middle of the bench and getting questions, uh, asking questions of students about how it works. Magnets, uh, again, just let them at the front of the lab and students come up and play with them. Particularly the younger students will try and figure out why uh, the magnets are suspended. And you try to send them away with a question and let them find out for themselves. This is a nice one as well. I'm not a chemistry teacher, but uh, the potato clock uh, gets great reaction as well. You can build up kind of investigations with this as well because students can actually use the electrodes and see will it work in maybe lemons, oranges, will it work in Coke, Diet Coke, etc. So you're getting them to think, is it just the potato that's responsible for the, the clock working or will it work with a number of other materials and works well? And some less traditional science toys then, I suppose. Again, all parked above in the, in the corner, the science toy corner. They would include this guy. This is a lovely one. It's very simple. It's called a hand boiler. Uh, and many of you will have seen it. And as you clasp this bulb here in your hand, the actual, obviously, uh, the, um, the, the air inside in it that is trapped is going to expand and it's going to cause the fluid, uh, the liquid material inside to rise. Let me show you that. This one now is uh, a game, actually. You can see this little guy in here. When you squeeze the bottle, he descends, and the idea is to latch him on to this little ring here. It's very difficult. It's the Cartesian diver, and we use this when we're talking about pressure in liquids when I'm introducing that idea in physics uh, and Archimedes principle and the law of flotation and so on. So that's called the Cartesian diver. Very simple. These guys, the little ducks, they change colour when you actually hold them. Uh, they respond to a change in temperature. And I have loads of those dotted around the lab, maybe 10 or 12 of them. And students grab them, hold on to them for the course of a, a class or a lesson, or some of them sit on them and just ask them at the end, why do you think they've changed colour? This is a nice one as well. This is all about balance. So um, I can't quite recall where, what the name of this guy is, but that board is balanced on the edge of a prism and to the students in the class it looks like the board is suspended from nothing but uh, it's indicating uh, the importance of centre of gravity and so on. That's a really nice one to have close to the top of the room near the board where students are, are looking at it and kind of in, in, uh, generates a bit of curiosity. This is a nice one as well. It's uh, This is a kind of a, a solar panel here of a voltaic cell. When light shines on this guy, it starts to vibrate or shake. So I'll leave these on window sills, and on a very good day when there's lots of light coming in the lab, these guys go nuts, and it kind of uh, piques the interest of the students as well. And they're very, very small and very cheap as well. All, I think, sourced on eBay. Yeah, this might be a little bit... Uh, uh, dangerous territory maybe, but some other toys then that maybe generate a bit more of a debate. So this one, if you if your uh, if your uh, circumstances allow it, it might be no harm to throw something a little bit kind of quirky or controversial. So this mug is is a lovely one. It's a little bit like the ducks that I showed you earlier on. It actually, when you fill it with hot water, 
uh, the image here at the front loses its beard, so it's obviously responding to the temperature. It's a really nice one. The students get a, a lot of uh, crack out of that. They really like that one. And then uh, well, a lot, lot of puppets. This is the first one. Uh, and this is a sperm, and it's to scale. You can see a paper clip there for scale, um, and having that around the lab always kind of get kind of gets a, a funnier reaction. But at least it gets the students talking. Then puppets. Uh, I've kind of started using these in the last number of years, uh, and what it's actually very good for, well, other than you know generating interest, is that it allows you to generate things like timelines when certain scientists lived. And then, of course, that generates a discussion about what their contribution to science was. So I have four or five puppets, Charles Darwin for the biology people and Albert Einstein for our physics friends. And also I got this collection here, I think we've got uh, Isaac in there as well, Isaac Newton and also Marie Curie. These are all available. Um, I mentioned the website earlier on, um, maybe Adina or uh, Viola might be able to note the, the website later on. It's um, the philosophersguilds.com or I can put it up on uh, chat later on when we finish the presentation. It's a really interesting website with lots of silly things that kind of are, are useful in the lab. Definitely of all the toys, the winner is this guy, the nodding bird. I'd say most people are kind of familiar with this. Um, the insatiable birdie, I think it is. It, it, it was developed originally, I think, in China. Um, and this gets a fantastic response. The thing is, this will be going all the time while I have lessons on, and the students are wondering why is it constantly going? You're not pushing it, you're not it's not plugged in. But the key thing here is never tell them how it works. Uh, the, the the idea is the gym they obviously are curious, so to build upon that curiosity, they need to go on and kind of source the information for themselves. So sorry to show you that. It, it works very well, available on eBay for about three or four euros, uh, very, very cheap. Also, we, we use models a lot in Ireland in our teaching, so particularly in biology, um, and there tends, we tend to put them away uh, out of eyesight, out of the eye, uh, out of the way of students. I leave them permanently on display. Again, they're a great visual stimulus, and uh, they can be extensive, so we should get use out of them, so obviously that's a... Uh, uh, a transverse section of, a, of, a, of a, the female part of a flower, or a flower just uh, in general. The ear, you can see the mims behind now as well. A transverse section of the skin, and then obviously the brain and so on. Yeah. And it just adds colour uh, to the lab. It's, the walls aren't bare, there's plenty going on, plenty to keep the students engaged. Got this recently. I still have to put it up. It's uh, an, as the box would suggest, an inflatable model of the solar system. So we need to get blowing that up and actually suspending it from the ceiling in the lab. This is a really nice one. I only found this because a colleague had it in her lab. It is a machine that uh, allows you to demonstrate wave motion, uh, and it, it's something that is, uh, makes well, quite a difficult concept: wave motion very very tangible it's easy for the students to see it and you see these black dots oscillating up and down as you turn the actual ratchet or the handle here and it works very very well uh, it's one of the better models that we have got yeah as i said I, I talked about these earlier on even to the point that students are now sending these on to me via email and with an attempt in, in an attempt to try and get them on the door. So there's a, even a little bit of competition for them. They, they work really, really well. And anything that goes on the door will then be put into the lab on any available space. So some, you can see some of them here. This guy here is a nice one, Freddie Mercury. Um, for our, again, for our physics friends, the Schrodinger uh, idea here. Okay, uh, some really, really, really nice ones. Again, I have a PowerPoint of maybe three or four hundred of those. So if anybody feels that they might get some use out of it, I'd be very happy to email it on or upload it on Dropbox or Google Drive. Yeah, now a couple of things that I've come to more recently, the how does it work kind of idea. Leaving something in the lab deliberately with a view to the students asking you, how does that work? 
uh, with and never having the intention of telling them. Um, I'm going to try and build on this this year. And if anybody has done something similar, I'd love to hear how it worked for you. And the whole idea of using a corner in the lab where they come in with an idea that they're interested in and trying to develop, I suppose, an experiment or a test to actually go and see how, what are the factors that affect it or how does something work, etc. So a couple of the ones that I have in mind this year are uh, these guys, which um, these are used to the best of my knowledge in, in nappies or at least something similar is used in nappies or diapers. They're also used in potted plants to absorb water. They swell when they absorb water and they slowly release it. But they've also got a refractive index that's very similar to water. So you can see there's a whole load of them in here in a beaker, but they're very difficult to see. So kind of getting students to uh, maybe investigate how these guys work. I leave a permanent display of them above near the teacher's desk. Also, um, the Institute of Physics, this is a very poor picture now, it doesn't do it justice, but the Institute of Physics have a kind of a model rocket uh, and its launcher. And I have used that when I've been teaching mechanics and physics and it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, using the launcher, building your rockets, varying the angle to see does that affect how you distance your rocket travels? Does it make any difference how many tail fins you put on? Does it matter how pointed the nose cone is? All of these are factors that can be investigated. Uh, and the students, of course, love building models and they even uh, prefer, uh, like even more, uh, sending things fired into the into the air using a rocket launcher. So this is really excellent. That would be something uh, I think you should certainly look into the U Institute of Physics and their rocket launchers, model rockets. This is the way, what I'm hoping to do this year is to kind of formalize that idea and actually have an inquiry corner uh, and getting students to come in with things they're curious about, using post-its, and then trying to develop, uh, I suppose, an experiment or a procedure to see how we would test uh, what they're curious about. So this is something that, that it's in the development stages for me, but it's certainly something I'd like to progress a little bit further. In terms of numeracy, then, in, certainly in, in an Irish education context, uh, the whole idea of literacy and numeracy is huge uh, and trying to promote it across all of the subjects, not just maths and English, uh, but uh, across the sciences, business and so on. So the use of the number line, which we've seen earlier on, a mathematics clock, which I have in the back of the lab and I'll show you in a moment. And I'd like to build a similar science clock this year. Uh, and the, the, the options are kind of uh, almost infinite there. We could use periodic table and atomic numbers or whatever. I'll show you that now. So that's the number line that's very obviously at the front of the lab and is there because a lot of our students would have difficulties with integers particularly, uh, so the negative numbers, and the number line helps them to do simple calculations without having to refer to the calculator constantly. This is the, this is the match clock that I have in the lab uh, for a number of years now. Uh, I built it myself. It's just a very simple, cheap clock mechanism. You don't even need the numbers here and you build your own kind of numbers. Uh, so X to the naught obviously is one and you get the idea. You can make up these as you wish. It works really, really well. The students uh, kind of can obviously relate to what the answer is and they kind of, then it kind of forces them as well to work out, well, why the hell is that equation there equal to four in this case? And it, it kind of allows them to you know, do a little bit of math almost and they don't realize it. Uh, yeah, another thing as well that I've done this year only, uh, I have to admit, is when we start with our very young students, we just go through, you know, natural numbers, real numbers, and then it can be very boring because all you're doing is adding and you're subtracting and the, the textbook exercises can be very stale. So this year I started to bring in um, uh, brochures from Aldi and Lidl and actually in some cases and asking really silly questions and getting them to answer it from the numbers quoted in the Aldi or in the little brochure. And of course, the idea being that this is real life and it makes maths a little bit more, I suppose, tangible, not just out of a book. And these are freely available. I don't know about other countries, but these are in papers every every Saturday and Sunday. So they're very easily sourced. And there are a whole heap of questions that you can just build and use using those brochures. 
Another tip or strategy that I use in Maths is the use of um, Dynamics math, Mathematics software. I'm sure a number of you will be familiar with these as well, GeoGebra and Sketchometry. Now, I won't go into the actual um, <clears throat> packages here. I'll show you screenshots. And in both cases, they're, they're free, uh, which means students can download them at home. And it's very, very useful for geometry and for graphing, even in science when you want to plot the results in an experiment and get your, your best fit line. GeoGebra and Sketchometry are excellent for that. So I'll just show you what a screen grab of uh, GeoGebra might look like. That will be GeoGebra. It doesn't have to be as fancy as that. You don't need to use it for integration or anything like that. Um, uh, and there's a number of options in it. You can draw in it. You can draw shapes freehand, etc. You can draw graphs, etc. Then Sketchometry is very, very tactile. Um, it, it works best with a tablet. You can actually use your finger to sketch in this case, a triangle, and then uh, sketchometry will recognize that it's a triangle that you're trying to draw, and it will actually uh, formalize that thing uh, in the shape of a triangle that's on screen for you, and you can then change its dimensions if you wish. Another thing that I've used is, um, and it's obviously under the uh, European School Net umbrella, is the GoLab portal, and I use this uh, when I want to introduce the students to inquiry-based lessons. Um, so if they want to build, for instance, a hypothesis, that's a very difficult concept for students. Uh, but they, there's actually a lovely uh, uh, activity on the portal that allows them to develop their own uh, uh, methods, but also their own hypothesis. I'll show you that there. So the hypothesis or question scratch pad, I've used that regularly. So literally, it's a case of fitting words in to build. <laughs> And I use this, as I say, when I'm trying to introduce uh, an inquiry-based lesson. I hope everybody is okay at the moment, uh, and I'm not going too quick. Yeah, I, I'm also involved in, or was involved this year, in Science on Stage. I will refer to this again later on. This is an excellent, excellent source of ideas for teaching concepts and, and topics in all of the sciences, but particularly physics and chemistry, uh, you'll get some really, really impressive stuff on that website. Um, we were in London over the summer and I would have uh, presented a very short lesson on using the scientific method to measure reaction times, and that link there will take you to the, the poster or the PDF of that. Again, if you want any further information on that, please send me an email or uh, I can send you the, uh, the the Word document to accompany it. Uh, but certainly science on stage is something worth looking up. Uh, worth looking up. Uh, and I did it with my own um, class of fifth years last year, which would be kind of 16, 17 years of age. And what we did was we investigated the effect of spinning, so getting people to spin around and how that affects their reaction times. The other uh, experiment that we did was to see the effect of different numbers of Mintos and Coke on the, the, the volume of foam produced. So getting away from just the kind of the gimmicky adding Mintos to Coke experiment, start introducing the idea of variables. So I wonder, does the volume of foam increase when I use three Mintos rather than two Mintos? Um, and it works very well. The students are familiar with that investigation, and it's uh, not a difficult step to start introducing the language of variables and con controls, so independent variables and dependent variables, etc. Not something that I use all that often, but uh, have been introduced to them is the whole idea of a virtual learning environment, a VLE. Um, lots of schools in Ireland have them. They're commercial. You have to pay for them. It depends on the quality of your broadband, which in our case, unfortunately, wouldn't be great. There are equivalents that are free, uh, and some of you will be familiar with those. I use Edmodo, but there is another one. I'm sure there are others that uh, is used routinely, and that's Schoology. As I say, I'm more familiar with Edmodo, but a number of my colleagues would use, would use Schoology. They're both free. This is what the interface for Edmodo would look like, so every class that I would have. I would have set up uh, with their own Edmodo page. I would get, ask the students to uh, request to join that group. 
and then any notes that I wanted to give the students, I would be able to upload on Edmodo. If I wanted, if I was out, for instance, for a day, and I wanted to give them homework or let work, leave them work, I could post a message to this wall here on Edmodo. Of course, the gimmick should be fairly obvious in the sense that it looks very like the interface with Facebook. It is very secure. I've never had any problems with it, uh, and it works well with my students. It's 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 uh, it's something that is spared me having to photocopy notes and so on, because I can put them all up online now digitally. As I say, I don't use Schoology, but this is what the interface looks like. I think the advantage of Schoology is that you can kind of give tests and you can get your um, you can get your data collated. But uh, as I say, somebody else now that might have more experience there could, uh, could fill in the blanks for us. On a similar team, the whole idea of freely available student response software. So if you develop a multiple choice exam, for instance, you can get the students to answer that using either a tablet or their mobile phone. The two that I'm most familiar with are particularly Kahoot, but to a lesser extent, Socrative.com, or Socrative, sorry. They're, again, freely available, uh, or at least the, the basic package is freely available anyway. I am familiar with Kahoot. It works very well. Students love it because the, you, there's questions on the board. You, They request to join your quiz or your exam. They get a, a unique code to join that game, and then you can put a time on the, each of the questions. Question, sorry and they can answer using their tablets or mobile phones or bring them into a computer lab where they have a, a fixed desktop PC. It works very well. Socrative is, is broadly similar, but again, I don't use Socrative. I'm more familiar with code. I mentioned this earlier on, and I'm mentioning it again because it's definitely something you will, if you go to this website, you will definitely come away with lots and lots of resources that you will use in your class uh, science on stage. It's been going for a number of years now, maybe upwards of 10, 12 years, and there's lots of resources logged there that you can access on their webpage. Uh, they're all presented as PDFs, and there's some fantastic stuff there. Really, really is loads and loads of teaching materials and a very easy uh, section for searching for different materials. All of these hyperlinks, web links are on the presentation that uh, hopefully uh, Adina or uh, Viola might be good enough to email out if people request it. This is kind of getting into the more uh, obscure things now, maybe um, not for everybody possibly, but I have kind of taken to studying myself uh, recently. Sorry, the link here is wrong. Uh, I work, I'm studying with the OU and I think when you're teaching, it's no harm actually sometimes to put yourself in the position of a student. Uh, and I studied, uh, I've done maths for the last three or four years, and I'm studying a general science module at the moment called Exploring Science. Um, and I have to say, it, it's very good. It's The, the content is excellent, um, and it's no harm to brush up on my own content and material. I'm out of college now maybe 14 or 15 years at this stage. So it's good to kind of see uh, new stuff and, and to hear about it. Um, also, there's a lot of freely available courses as well. Uh, Allison, for instance, is a website that does free courses. And Coursera, uh, again, if anybody is interested in those, I, can, I, I, own, I don't actually have them mentioned here in the presentation, but they are uh, they're freely available courses. People can register to do them online. It doesn't cost you anything. So that's just more, that's my OU commitments. And then finally, uh, I'll I go through some just kind of random thoughts really on, on, I, on things that have worked well for me over the last number of years. And one of them is when I'm looking for resources, and we always are looking for resources, uh, using the advanced search option on Google. And oftentimes it's PowerPoints that you're looking for and just to select the actual file type PowerPoint. This may seem very sim uh, simple, and apologies if it is, but it, it saves a huge amount of time having to go through pages and pages of results when it's PowerPoints that you're looking for. And that's the advanced search option there, and you just need to select PowerPoint. Okay, and won't dwell on that. I, from an Irish point of view, and I wonder is this similar across lots of other countries? We would have subject associations that would meet every now and again. Um, so obviously my background is science and maths, 
and I would join those and we would meet maybe three or four times a year. Usually it's in the evenings, but they're great places to actually get advice and also to access resources. Uh, really excellent. Uh, and I I would strongly advise anybody, particularly if they're starting, starting out in a teaching career, to join their local subject associations because you will make the world of contacts and you will have help at hand if you run into any difficulties. So in Ireland, our subject association is the Irish Science Teachers Association, ISTA.ie. And the equivalent for, for maths is the Irish Maths Teachers Association, the IMTA. And I would be a member of those for a number of years. They, they all also hold national conferences. Another one as well, this, is, this would be one of my top pieces of advice to young teachers particularly, is to sign up to the TES, which is, for those of you that aren't familiar, the Times Educational Supplement. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a newspaper in England, but it's spawned this kind of educational resource uh, over the last maybe 20, 30 years now, and they produce uh, a, a month, a bi, I think it's a fortnightly magazine, and there's a huge number of resources on their website. Teachers are constantly uploading materials to that website. It is certainly worth your while logging on to the Times Educational Supplement. Uh, and there, there is a, you do have to subscribe for some of the materials. Um, it can cost, I think, maybe £90, I think, for the year, but it is something well worth doing. The amount of resources are phenomenal. There's a huge number of resources on there. And a huge number of teachers as well, obviously, is the number would suggest there. So that's the tes.co, uh, sorry, tes.com, actually, my apologies. Also, I mentioned the Institute of Physics earlier on. Lots of resources available internationally as well. Uh, these are just three organizations that I would use their websites for materials regularly. So the Institute of Physics, the Association uh, for uh, what is it? the Association of Secondary Edu Science Education in, uh, in, in the United Kingdom, and then uh, the Mathematics in Education and Industry, MEI. Loads of uh, very useful materials on those websites for physics, uh, science, and maths teachers particularly. I'll show you there what the interface is now. So that's the Institute of Physics. There's a, a big education section there, as you can see, with lots of resources. So the, that rocket and the launcher that I referenced earlier on would be on that website, and lots of other CDs and DVDs as well. The Association for Science Education, that would be similar to our uh, Irish Science Teachers Association in Ireland, but obviously on a, a far greater scale. Lots of resources there, and they hold a national conference every year as well, and there will be hundreds of exhibitors, so you get lots of uh, free posters and ideas for bringing back to your lab. And that's the Mathematics and Education and Industry. I really like their te maths textbooks. They're excellent, um, and I would use those for producing my own notes. Yeah. A lot of the, the, the memes that I referenced earlier, I would have got those by following certain um, Facebook groups. There's loads of them, absolutely loads of them, and some Twitter feeds as well. Uh, you will always pick up quirky things there. It might be a link to a YouTube video that you can use in school, or you can get some interesting kind of uh, current affairs in, in science that you can bring back to your class and discuss. For instance, the whole idea of Obama being in uh, Alaska, isn't it, with Bear Grylls at the moment, that's something that uh, I would have become aware of by following the feed from uh, Facebook. So this one is slightly controversial. You can forget the, the bad word there, but that's a really excellent Facebook group for, for memes and stuff. Re Actually, this is something that just kind of uh, came into my mind. This is something that I started to do recently, which is to ask students to actually tweet the answers to their homework. Um, it's something I'd like to do a little bit more of this year. Uh, and also maybe to get them to tweet the steps in an experiment to try and build it up that way. So I'm only, I'm relatively new to Twitter. I don't use it all that much, but it's something that uh, if I could find an environment that was safe, you know, data and student uh, safety, etc., then I would certainly like to use it because all of our students are on Twitter. 
and this is YouTube. I like to follow this guy, Neil deGrease Tyson. He's some very uh, interesting talks, etc. TED is another example of a website that would be very uh, has some really, really good stuff for science. This may not suit everyone, but I don't know about uh, other European countries, but in Ireland, we have examinations at the end of uh, formal secondary school education uh, and also three years into it. Uh, and it's a good idea to become an examiner because it gives you, I suppose, an insight into how exams are corrected and then will that help you to kind of uh, adjust your teaching and, and also the learning of your students. So I've been doing correcting exams for 10 years and I have to say it's it opens your eyes to the way maybe the best way to teach things. So uh, our examining body is the State Examinations Commission. And I would obviously, I don't actually correct biology, it's science that I correct, but that's an example of a biology paper in Ireland or a couple of months ago. And then that's the marketing scheme. And it's very interesting to read the marketing scheme and read the papers and to see what they're after. This is something that I've been doing recently and anytime I go abroad, uh, I look for textbooks on my subject from other countries. That might sound desperately sad. It probably is, but it's uh, you always come back with something different, uh, a different way of maybe ordering the topics, a different demonstration of, I don't know, Lenz's Law or something like that. It just always works broadening your horizons and seeing how other people do it. There's no guarantee that the way you're doing it is the only way or necessarily the right way. But these are a couple of books now that I source in England that I use. Uh, Biology for You is very good. And also Science Progress. I think there's two or three in that series, which would be the equivalent of our junior set in Ireland for kind of 13, 14 and 15 year olds. This one as well, from time to time, uh, we're fortunate in, I suppose, in Limerick, where I am in Ireland, is that we have a, a very good university on our doorstep called the University of Limerick and they would often be involved in research uh, in science education. And from time to time, they look for schools to participate. So I would have been involved in chain reaction. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, uh, a couple of years ago. And this year, I'm going to get involved in TEMI, the TEMI project, uh, Teaching uh, Mysteries Through Inquiry Incorporated. Um, and I'll just show you their websites now. So they're always looking for schools to come on board. It's no huge work either. It's something that will enhance your own teaching and learning. Uh, and it's good professional development as well to kind of see how other uh, other colleagues around the around your around your school are, are involved. And so that's the Chain Reaction website. I think it's in its third and final year this year. And there's resources on there. They have what are called pupil research briefs, PRBs, and they are you can see them there. They are inquiry based lessons. Uh, so going away from your traditional science lesson where the teacher does all of the talking uh, and putting the emphasis on the students actually finding out for themselves. So it was, it was well worth doing. And that's a, a picture from two years ago. Uh, that's myself. That's my class of first years. They were all kind of 14, 15 years of age. And that's my colleague, Lisa Kiley. I'll just go back there. I had more hair then. This is the Timmy website, so teaching mysteries through, uh, sorry, teaching inquiry through mysteries incorporated. We're getting involved in this this year, myself and Lisa, that you saw there a minute ago. So uh, it, it'd be curious to see how that goes. This again is, I suppose, linked to the subject associations idea. Uh, join online forums for your subject area. I've only very recently come to this. We're fortunate in Ireland that there's an excellent selection of online forums uh, for the sciences. So you have it for science, you would have it for biology, separately, physics, chemistry, agricultural science, applied mathematics, all of them are, are taken care of. And it's a great place to swap ideas and to swap resources. It's really, really brilliant. And the, 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 kind of, the spirit it's done in is really positive. But that's just, it's a Google Groups. And I, I would definitely go and find out if you have an equivalent in your country and certain, if not, maybe maybe form it. It's absolutely brilliant. And then lots of different threads. So for instance, this is the Sharing Science one. Very recently, there's been lots of talk and debate on inquiry-based learning. And then again, you can see here, the big emphasis on numeracy and so on. So really, really worth uh, getting involved in those. 
this is, I suppose, we wouldn't be here unless we knew of international projects like Scientix, which comes under the umbrella of European Schoolnet. Other ones that I would have been involved in, and currently I actually are, am involved in, uh, in e-twinning, uh, and I have a project at the moment with a Danish colleague about uh, biology and invasive species. And we were going to get that up and running now. Goal Labs, I've already discussed, excellent for introducing inquiry based learning. And Science on Stage, just really, really, it's fantastic resources available there. Uh, hundreds of resources, all ready to go, uh, and very simple stuff. The eTwinning desktop, the Goal Lab portal. Uh, science on stage. Again, all the hyperlinks uh, will be available in the PowerPoint anyway. And that's Science on Stage Ireland. So we were, as I say, we were in London there during the summer. That's me there, right at the back, out of the way. And then that brings me to a conclusion. I just want to thank you for taking part. I hope some of you will keep in touch uh, via the email and the Twitter handle at the, uh, on screen currently. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope I spoke slowly enough and I didn't bore anybody and you got something out of it anyway. And if Viola is back, uh, I'm happy to take any questions or any feedback and absolutely I would love to hear somebody's suggestions as well, something that I can do on Monday morning that would improve my own teaching. Thank you again. Thanks to you, Patrick. Thanks Viola. Um, as Adina already wrote in the chat, we will uh, upload the recording of the video on the scientific repository and also uh, we will share Patrick's presentation so that all the links will be available shortly to you. Um, mm -hmm. There were also many comments and suggestions on tools and, and other resources in the chat and we can add a list of those tools also suggested by the participants and also uh, I believe that it may be useful for them to have uh, some more references or even a list of the toys or some of the tools okay. to show the picture of, maybe, so yeah. that they want to find some of those uh, amazing uh, tools you showed. Okay. Um, I can do that. Yeah, absolutely. It would be my pleasure. I'll make a list of them and uh, as far as possible, I'll try and write down where I Yeah, hi. Patrick is uh, experiencing a, a small technical problem. He will be back in a second. In the meanwhile, if anyone has uh, other questions or some more comments, um, I will invite you to share them in the chat so that we can see and uh, Patrick will answer them to get Patrick back online with us. Hopefully it will happen very soon. Yeah, yeah. Hi, hi again. Sorry, okay. I lost you there today for a minute. Yeah. Yeah, we are just uh, talking about the amazing list of toys and tools you showed that we can also share with the participants, so uh, together with the presentation, so they have all the available. And I was asking everyone uh, if they have some questions or additional comments for you, uh, to please write yeah. in, the, in the chat so that you can answer. Okay. Have I got that open? Um, in the meanwhile, just to break the highs, uh, there were many comments at the beginning also about the um, very interesting use of toys that you do in the class. And uh, I just break the highs with a question of my own. Okay. Um, so, do you also create lessons or other activities related to the toys mechanism? So, on how they work or yeah. you know, some explanation during kind of worksheets and so on, Viola, is this to, to, to run with the toys? A, a, a prepared worksheet? Okay. Yeah, in some cases, yes, like uh, the nodding board, for instance, I would definitely kind of would need sometimes to, sometimes to give students a, a worksheet to accompany that. And really what you're doing there is you're kind of going through the, the, the list of options that it can't be nearly to explain how it works. And by the time they've kind of ruled out things like magic or maybe electricity or somebody kind of uh, is sending telepathic messages or whatever, they'll kind of get to the idea that there has to be some significance to the bird uh, dipping into the water. And 
some of the better students will kind of get the idea of maybe, okay, the water is causing, is evaporating, what's that doing to the actual temperature in the glass tube? And they get there eventually, but I, I, I do sometimes create worksheets to accompany them, but not often, very often they are just there to get students thinking and to kind of, you know, get them curious because it's, I don't know how it works in other countries, but all the students do science up until when they're 15, 16 years of age. But after that, it's kind of competitive. We would be in competition with business subjects, art subjects to get students to continue on studying science. So we really kind of want to keep them. And it's one of the ways to do it is to just constantly challenge them with maybe what looked like silly things sometimes, but there's 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 some really interesting science behind it. Is that okay? Yeah, it's uh, very interesting. Um, we may have a question from the chat. Uh, someone is asking if you have you use Makey Makey or maybe any other um, kind of uh, engineering IT tool. To I haven't actually. I've heard of Makey Makey, but I I haven't used it. I'd like to hear a little bit more about it though. I haven't used it. No, is it? It's not. Um, it's not stock animation, is it? It's kind of building up a, a video using you know, still photos. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not familiar with Makey Makey, Viola, no, and that. Okay, yeah. And I definitely write it down here now, and it's something that I look up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that in this kind of session, uh, resources and suggestions are also coming from the participants, and yeah. so we can learn. I, I, I'd love to get those, a list of those. Yeah, that'll be brilliant. Yeah, it be excellent. Is uh, there any other question or comments you would like to share with Patrick? Um, I think uh, we can just give maybe a few seconds for okay. if someone else want to write. It takes a little, yeah, it takes no. a little while to write in the chat. And that will come up on my screen if you all want it. Yeah, if you open the chat tab, you yeah. can also see. Yeah. I think I have a voice at the chat tab. Yep, I do, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes, I see it now. Okay, I hope I haven't missed everything here now. Yeah, there is some more um, comments and suggestions on what Makey Makey is, and I believe a video on it. So, yeah. if you, you have already some oh, yeah. for our participants. Yeah. Great. It's like, where do you connect yourself? Okay, I must look that up. This is um, Sonia. Thank you very much, Sonia. I'm. Uh, I'm not familiar with it, but I would certainly look it up. Uh, Viola, will you be able to track or capture all of those chat messages? Yeah, the chat messages we will uh, copy and we'll uh, share with the list of links or resources. Perfect. Uh, and, and together with the presentation. Yeah, there are several um, comments on tools, for example, Socrative, Kahoot, um, okay. Let's yes. Face. So it would be. I'm only seeing a portion of those. Uh, will you copy me in that email? Uh, obviously, uh, the other or CC me in that email with the list of resources and so on. I'd love to go through that myself and see what I can get out of it and uh, use it. Of course, yeah. We will, we will send a follow-up email in a few days uh, okay. with a survey also for for all participants, and we will share these resources and the comments on the chat. And also the presentation, as I said, and recording will be in the scientific repositories uh, as one of the resources there. Excellent. So it will be available for even more uh, okay. by the audience to share. Excellent. Okay, very good. Yeah. Um, I have to say it's been a, an interesting experience using the webinar as well. It's not something that I've done before. It seems to have worked reasonably well. Um, uh, and it's something I might look into doing myself. Hello, everyone. Uh, we have technical problem with the webcam, but we are trying to solve it. So thank you for your patience. Uh, we will try to have Patrick back online with us for the last questions or last greetings. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm just uh, making my way up through the comments there. I think I might have lost you for a minute, did I? Yeah. It's just um, some of the participants are thanking you for, for the chat. For yeah, the very talk. good. Yeah. Um, since we don't have any other question, um, would you like to um, 
give us uh, like just one last suggestion or make a final remark on? Yeah, I, I suppose uh, the the only suggestion I I would make is um, uh, the, the the actual the networking from all of these events. You now it's not just scientists; it's going to your uh, your local teacher association meetings. It's uh, going to their national conferences. It's getting involved in E20. It's by far and away superior to anything you will ever learn in a teacher training college. The experience that's around you is huge and to try to tap into that and even if you come back with one really really small thing it, it can make a world of difference to your teaching and you just you know, it keeps you fresh it keeps your students fresh uh, and you're not just kind of going over all ground constantly so i learned as much today or will learn as much today when i go through the comments hello everyone we we lost patrick again and we are trying to get him back online. In the meanwhile, yeah, uh, thank you very much to everybody for participating in today's webinar with Patrick Dandon. And also thank you for all your suggestions and comments. Yes, sorry, I lost you again, Viola. Yeah. Um, just, yeah, we were just um, thanking all the participants for, for being here with us today and for, for sharing their suggestions and comments. Just one final comment for myself, is it? Yeah, comment for yourself. Uh, sorry, yeah. I, I, so, yeah, no, um, I, I just to say, uh, I was just saying there, the more you can get out and interact with teachers, the better. Uh, that means going to your subject associations or going to national conferences or just uh, just meeting teachers in general and swapping ideas, both nationally and internationally. Like that's why Scientix is so important and e-twinning and Go Labs and all of these things, uh, because the, the the wealth of um, the wealth of of knowledge is is huge. It's, you learn far more by talking to your colleagues than you will from any textbook or college that you might have attended. So uh, I'm sure I learned as me, as much as anybody this evening uh, when I go through the when I go through the the chat messages, and that's what it's all about. So I'd like to thank everybody uh, and also the school European School Nurse Viola for hosting the web uh, the webinar and giving me the opportunity to present. Thanks to you, Patrick, and. Thanks again to all the participants. Uh, we have, as you can see, Patrick in the chat. We have. I think I I, I sent that message to you that <laughs> incorrectly privately, so I better correct that. Uh, I just want to definitely thank everybody. Sorry about that. So thanks again, everyone, for being here with us today from European Schoolnet, from me, Viola, and Adina, my colleague, that who was assisting you uh, in the chat. And um, see you at the next webinar of the series that will be on the 16th of September in two weeks. And you can find the information on uh, Scientix website uh, and the webinar events. And we'll be sending. Uh, further reminders and information on, on the webinar. Excellent. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you very much, Viola. Thank you.